Welcome to the OrthoCast. Today we have David Erhan. You can find him on Twitter and YouTube at the Real Med White. But I would say he is one of, if not the best theology channels on YouTube. Definitely go subscribe to him. He's done tons of streams with other Orthodox YouTubers, especially Jay Dyer, and they've covered so many very important topics over the years. But David's specialty really is refuting Oriental Orthodoxy. He has a lot of good videos refuting atheism, defending icon veneration on Catholicism, going in-depth on the filioque, on Sacred Heart, showing what the Orthodox view is on original sin. And I like to direct people to his channel because my channel is very, like, surface level and but he goes into extreme depth so thank you so much for joining us today your videos really do make a difference especially your eastern catholics refute rome video that was an uh, eye-opening video for me so thank you so much for joining us i'm really happy to be here i i remember um the first time you made a video on your channel you uploaded to the uh, uploaded to the discord i still remember that day when i saw like you like first posting and i was like oh it's just some i guess it's really cool some ex-catholic guy or something like that who's, who became orthodox and then like your channel kind of like just blew up right so uh, i'm glad to be here and i'm happy to talk about like whatever you want to talk about and um i I tend to, I guess this is one of my deficiencies, right? I, I try to talk about things in a surface level, but at some point, some issues, right? They, they have to, you have to go in depth to kind of understand yeah. what it is about, right? And sometimes I try to go too in depth. So I'll try to cover a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. I try to cover things in a more surface level stuff with some depth, right? And yeah, I, I think this will be great. Yeah. Awesome. So my first question for you, some people may not know, but David is actually born and raised in Turkey. It's a Muslim country. I mean, for Muslim countries, it's a more secular one. But what was your upbringing like? Like was religion taken very seriously? So yeah, what, what, what was it like? And what eventually led you to Christianity? Yeah, well, I'll, I'm gonna have to make a correction. Um, though I, I do live in Turkey, I wasn't I wasn't born there. I was mm. born to Turkish parents, right? I was raised in the culture, but I was born and raised in Norway for nine years. Oh, and then I moved okay. to Turkey. So I, I will I will make a correction there. <laughs> yeah. um, aside from that, with, with relation to religion, I don't talk about my like personal life too much. But yeah. what I can talk about in terms of religion is that pretty much for most of my life, I didn't really care about religion. Um, mm. I sometimes flip between agnostic atheism and agnostic theism, but consistently with agnosticism at some point i was you know i was kind of more atheistic sometimes i was like well i guess god does exist but if he does exist i don't really care like i kind of had that kind of a viewpoint i didn't really care about it until really 2015 16 and the, the aftermath of like a lot of what happened in 2016 is what made me start to take religion more seriously i started to respect it a lot more i always respected i always had some kind of fondness towards christianity that my upbringing might have something to do with it because, as I said, I've lived in Norway, right? Yeah. Uh, but I always liked Christianity, always respected it. And w once I, I always had this idea about religion where, like, religion is just this, you know, religion is just this, you know, you just go to church or whatever, you do some prayers, and you go home, you, you feel better about yourself. And that's just what religion is, right? I just thought that's what it was about. And when I started to realize that there's, in fact, a worldview, there's like what I will call like a war behind various different religions. Uh, there's a logic behind it. There's a metaphysic yeah. behind it. I took it like I really start to respect uh, Christianity specifically a lot more due to its history and due to mm -hmm. kind of thought that goes into it. And just it kind of started from that. And, you know, there is also some reasons that I won't really endorse today, but like kind of stuff like, you know, I one of the reasons I became Orthodox because, well, you know, it's the religion of the lands that I, I lived in. Right. It's kind of like, you know, the religion, I guess, for me. And it's more traditional and it has a much better claim of being the religion of, you know, the early church fathers and so on and so forth. But then afterwards, I start to realize, you know, better reasons for it. I guess the, the fact that it's the religion that Christ established, right? It's, yeah. it's a really good religion. It's a really good reason for being an Orthodox Christian, right? But I will basically say that these will be the main factors for what... Uh, helped me become Orthodox Christian. Yeah, I've been I've been living in Turkey for a couple of years, and uh, I guess I should also mention this. I was baptized. I, w I went to the United States to study for one and a half years. Mm -hmm. I was baptized as an Orthodox Christian there. Ever yeah. since then, I've 
I've moved to Turkey. I moved back to Turkey, and I've been living here ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's actually a really good point that you brought up because I was raised kind of, I was like atheist, you know, secular. And my idea of religion, like growing up in America, was like evangelical Christianity. And it just felt so goofy, you know, with the people, the hands in the air. And it just felt completely unserious. But when you actually like look into like the traditions and history of something like orthodoxy, where it's like it does have all this logic behind it, it has all this history. It's not just something that they're making up on the spot. And that's why I think like Protestantism in in American Christianity is so devastating because it just makes Christianity seem completely unserious. But I had the same impression about Protestantism specifically. <laughs> like to me, it sounded like it sounded like a no starter, right? I mean, yeah. My my logic was very simple. It's like it's obvious. It obviously started in the 16th century, mm-hmm. right? It's obviously a 16th century phenomenon. But if it, if a religion is true, it supposedly it should be the true religion since the start of time, right? Yeah. And Protestantism has a massive block <laughs> of like empty space of time between yeah. the first and the 16th centuries, right? And and that's really that's another reason why, for example, I'm not a Muslim because if if I were to become a Muslim, I will have a very difficult time explaining the the time between the first and seventh centuries because yeah <laughs> there wasn't any islam there right uh-huh. so what was the true religion then and I, I asked this to a lot of muslims and they kind of were just like well that's not really important actually it is right if, yeah if you're supposed to be the true religion that's something you should care about right so sorry for cutting off again but i kind of had to add that point yeah no you're completely right there's just this huge blackout period in something like islam especially since allah literally purposely deceived everyone and made it look like jesus died like which started Christianity, why did Allah wait 600 years to clarify that actually Allah replaced him at the last second and Jesus didn't actually die? Yeah, that, that's a huge point. Uh, point is like there's this blackout period where things got corrupted. That's what all the basically heretics say is that basically the, the church fell away and needed to be restored by a new prophet. Like Muslims in, in that way are like the first Protestants. You know, they think that Muhammad came and he got the, 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 the book from an angel, even though, you know, the Bible specifically warns about that in uh, Galatians 1.18. But, but how was that, like, going to your liturgy for the first time and, like, really starting to say, like, this is actually true? For me, well, I'll, I'll kind of be blunt. I mean, I kind of, there's a lot of things that I looked into liturgy and I was like, this doesn't really make any sense. But then I kind of thought to myself, well, it's a re- well, it's religion. I don't really know a lot of stuff about it. I'll just like, I'll just keep my mouth shut and I'll just observe. And if it makes sense, I'll find out about it at some point. And that's kind of the, the main attitude that I had with yeah. a lot of things about the faith that I didn't really understand is I just kind of, I, I try to be patient. I try to look for answers. And sometimes I wasn't calm about it. Sometimes I had, you know, moments of, like crises of faith in some parts of my life and stuff yeah. like this. But the general attitude I will recommend people to have, especially is to kind of be more patient, be more yes. sober minded. And just like if there's something that you don't understand or a question that you can't really find an answer to, you don't have to find the answers to every single question. Um, mm. I think we, we kind of have to have that some kind of humility in order to learn yeah. things. And that's that was one of the biggest revelations for me because I remember I used to be one of these like, super like debate bro kind of people like i will always debate people argue with people all the time um i've stopped doing that although i i might you know continue doing that at some point but i stopped doing that right and i just told myself you know every time i argue with these people i know they're wrong but i can't really pinpoint exactly why and i will have to read the books that the arguments are related to in order to refute these people right and and i will always be frustrated so i just said to myself I'll just read the books and once I read all of these books, I'll just debate people. And and I realize, well, once you start learning things, you realize how little you actually yeah. do know. Mm-hmm. And ever since then, I kind of just made my child for love. Well, the two main purposes was to help people that are new to orthodoxy. Um, I think you do a much better job at that than I do. And so it kind of ends up becoming more like an in-depth like video journey, I suppose, and kind of like note-taking for myself right? I, yeah. I kind of make the videos for other people but i also make them for myself mm-hmm. right so that i can take notes and share them with people share my findings with people and if, if it helps people then you know it's wonderful if it helps me it's also wonderful but if it, obviously if it helps people and helps them become orthodox then that's that's magnificent right that's pretty much um much more than i can ask for it because that's at the end of the day that's one of the 
greatest things that you can do as an Orthodox Christian is to help other people become Orthodox Christian by the grace of God, right? So that's kind of how my channel ended up becoming over time. Um, is, yeah. Is how I will say. Yeah, I think that's such a key point that you focus on for like new converts, like just be patient. Like, it's not like, it's not like Protestantism where you're just like saved overnight and all of a sudden you're a Christian or you're not a Muslim and you just take your Shahada and all of a sudden it's a slow process. I think every Orthodox person is still in the, you know, the process of becoming more and more Orthodox every day, like hopefully becoming a saint. So like some of these things, you're not going to find answers to right away. You need to just, who are received into the church, like that's just like, it's like the start of your marriage to the church. Like you're going to, you're, you're committing that you're going to be Orthodox for life. So, you know, all the questions that I've had, you know, just pray on it. It's not going to be answered immediately, but it's just, you know, having faith in Christ. But, and then the next thing I want to talk about is I totally agree with the YouTube channel. Like I started my YouTube channel just cause for my own information and trying to like put my thoughts onto paper. Like, one of my channels, you know, I do Dyer clips too. And that was because like I was watching Jay Dyer and there's all these amazing clips and I'm like, I want to share these for other people and I want these for reference for myself. And so that's why I just started making those clips because it's like, I, I want these for myself. And like my that first video that you're talking about of why I left Catholicism for Orthodoxy, I actually made that because like when I was leaving Catholicism, I wanted to like explain to all my Catholic friends of like why I'm leaving. So I made this giant presentation kind of compiling everything into that and I kept, you know, practicing it. And I'm like, might as well record it and upload it. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did because that kind of, you know, jump started my channel. But yeah, I think that's what makes like a good YouTuber is like you like doing it, you know, for yourself because when you're really passionate about it, um, it, it helps other people. But yeah, I definitely agree. I think that's, I think it's kind of just, it's something, it's like a process and a lot of orthodoxy as well is kind of like a process in general, right? Uh, and, and as you said, it's like, you're not going to learn a lot of things instantly. You're not going to be uh, fully knowledgeable about things, but the answer is there. You just yes. kind of have to yeah. look for it. And this is, and you know, there's obviously we focus, a lot of us focus on like the dogmatic stuff as well, but there's also an aesthetic, you know, spiritual aspect of this, right? Like praying and stuff like yeah. that um, definitely helps, but I, you don't really need me to tell you that. <laughs> so, but it's still good to remind people about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I want to talk about next is that you have you saw a niche that had not been filled in Oriental Orthodoxy. There's not a lot of videos on it. And um, that that's why you, you know, filled that niche because you saw it. I, I saw someone jokingly say, what Oriental Orthodox person hurt you where you had to make all this, this entire like playlist and everything. But no, it's Ooh. because, you know, these theological issues do matter a lot. And because of that, you have an entire playlist. You've debated these issues. And this theology is relevant. Like I, I was at Vesper Saturday night and we were like chanting this theology about, you know, the two natures not mixed. And there is a tendency, especially in America, for ecumenism and to say, oh, these, you know, Oriental versus Eastern Orthodox, you know, we're, we're, ba we're basically the same. It's false. But it's very prideful of us to think that, you know, all these saints who fought against these issues, you know, they're actually wrong. You know, we, we got to figure it out. That is very prideful. That's the exact opposite of orthodoxy, especially since it's more than that. I mean, the, the people, the Oriental Orthodox, they only accept four councils. Like so much has gone on uh, since that. The motivation, first of all, like it's not it's not really well, there's two main there's one, there's two main motivations. Mm -hmm. Well, two main things that I want to know, not motivations, but two things I want to note about my motivations. So called. Yeah. the first thing is that um, if this was about my personal like or dislike towards um, Orientals or Copts and Syriacs, I will actually be saying positive things about them because from my like personal, you know, family, friends and people I know, um, I've, you know, I had good experiences with them. Yeah. Right? I don't have any negative experiences in person online it's it's a different story but it's mostly from yeah. people you know online you can find anything right it's exactly. not really much yeah. for a good reason mm -hmm. but the second thing i want to note is what really motivated me about this is that i saw a lot of people online a lot of orientals online um, saying a lot of inflammatory statements about our faith and and making a, lo a lot of these claims and arguments and i know as i was trying to find the answers to these things right I noticed 
you know, as different from like with Roman Catholicism, atheism, I could find answers easily. But with this, yeah. I couldn't find any answers at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, you because I, I noticed that what they say is very different from the basic uh, surface level stuff that you see online a lot, right? Yeah. I read a lot of different art articles from various different websites, including websites that a lot of people respect. Um, and there wasn't any answer, really any answer at all. Uh, it yeah. was just like, oh, monophysics is bad because they believe there's a mixture. Well, they claim there's not a mixture. So how do you answer that? Well, there's nothing, for example, right? Or they have their specific formula or model. They had their own way of reading St. Kirill of Alexandria. And it seems pretty close to what, you know, he seems to say the same things that they're saying on a surface level. How do we respond to these things? There's zero answer at all. So what I had to do is I first read uh, the book on St. Kirill of Alexandria by Father John McGuckin to kind of first get an idea about the conflict between the story of St. Kirill and what happened afterwards in the first place. That book isn't even, isn't even about monophysicism. It's about Nestorianism. Yeah. Then I started to read several other materials that um, I make note of some of my videos, right? I kind of talk about the various different books that I've read on this topic. And then I started re I, I start to read their own saints and theologians, and I started to realize, okay, um, some of the things they say, uh, they're kind of hiding, right? Like, like, they're kind of hiding what they really believe. So, for example, some monophysite articles will say, like, all, like contemporary ones online today, they will say they believe that Christ is divine and a human will, right? Like divine will and a human will, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that's not true. wrong. Uh, they don't believe that. Severus Sophantic explicitly denies there being two wills in Christ. He says there's a one divine human composite will. That's very different from what we believe. Yeah. We believe Christ being human and divine has two natures and he has faculties proper to the two natures. He has a human will and he has a divine will, for example, right? So mm -hmm. he has two wills just like he has two natures. So there's a big difference there as well. Moreover, with, with like nature, like what it means, um, there's kind of like this different system, different theological system uh, that they have where they think that a person, all a person is, is a particular nature. Whereas we as Orthodox, we make a distinction between nature and person. This yeah. is very key for the Trinity because in Trinity, there's one nature, three persons. Whereas in monophysitism, really a person is just a particular nature, right? And if there are two natures in Christ, that means there are two particular natures, meaning there are two persons. This is why it results in Nestorianism. This is why they say, you know, in order to not be in a storm, you have to say there there has to be one nature, right? So there is this mm. kind of dialectic within this position due to their inability to make a distinction between nature and person and confusing the two categories, whereas we make the distinction. And because we make the distinction, we avoid this dialectic and we can say that just like in the Trinity, there's three divine persons and one nature. In Christ, there's one divine person, there's one divine Jesus Christ, but there are two natures in Christ, the divine nature and human nature. Mm -hmm. So that's like on a basic level that kind of is one of the answers that you can use on, on this perspective. But another thing about the ecumenism point that I want to make, I want to point out, a lot of people point out the joint agreement that was signed in 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, I made a video responding to that as well. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I have to respond to. That's why <laughs> there's a massive playlist. It's not because I was yeah. mad or anything like this, because there's a lot of things to respond to, right? Yeah. I don't want to leave anything out in the open. And one of the things that I pointed out is that, well, this isn't really a serious theological document. It doesn't even, it makes statements that are contradictory to monophysitism, really. And it's not really followed as, as if it's some kind of like a dogma or some kind of like a guideline. It's just a couple of theologians gathered together and say, we, yeah. you know, we superficially make the same slogans. And that's the big problem with a lot of heretics is that they think about slogans, right? <laughs> yeah. In their minds, they just have a bunch of slogans, filioque, oh. right? Or one nature of the, of, of yeah. the word incarnate or like these like slogans and they seek those slogans in the fathers and then they pick them out and they make their whole theology around it without like ignoring all of these things that were said before and after those slogans yeah and that's a big mistake that i see both from roman catholics and from protestants and from monophysite all heretics make this problem right like protestants make the uh started doing this recently with faith alone they see St. John Chrysostom says, we're justified by faith alone. This means sola fide. <laughs> yeah. It, it means something completely different because uh -huh. for St. John Chrysostom, for example, faith that works true love is what justifies you. That's not faith alone. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not faith alone in the Protestant sense. It's yeah. the same thing with the one incarnate nature model. For example, the one nature that is incarnate, well, it's enfleshed with the human nature. So maybe it might be speaking about two natures, for example, right? So thinking in these, in these slogans don't help you. Uh, mm -hmm. And some arguments, you asked about some arguments that might kind of quickly 
respond to this. And one of the arguments that I will I will make against, and this is kind of like a popular argument you see from St. Maximus the Confessor and Leon to Jerusalem, is just asking, okay, if Christ is one nature, is this nature created or is it uncreated? Mm -hmm. If it is created, it's not divine. If it's uncreated, it's not human. If it's both, there's a problem here because one thing in and of itself cannot simultaneously be created or uncreated at the same time, right? It must have to, there it one is a different kind of a property from the other that corresponds to the nature. So by saying both, you're saying Christ has two natures. And at that point, yeah. you're basically saying, okay, the Orthodox are correct. <laughs> we are wrong. Right. <laughs> so that's 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 kind of that doesn't really help you. And it, and it goes to the, the activities of Christ, it goes to the wills of Christ. One of the things that people don't know is that, it, that one of the reasons why the tomb of Leo was so heavily criticized by the monophysites is not just because it speaks about two natures, but it also speaks about the properties of the two natures. So, for example, the property will be like the property of the divine nature will be that it's incorporeal, that it's uncreated, right? Mm -hmm. And he's and Saint Leo speaks about that, and Saint Leo also speaks about there being two activities of the of the natures that are cooperating with each other, and that's a key point as well because they're in unison, right? But he says that there are two activities, meaning that there are two energies, meaning that there are also two wills. And the Monophysite Dioscorus and Severus of Antioch, they say this is one of the reasons why the Chalcedonians are heretics. So it's not just one nature, but they also believe that Christ has one will, that he has one mind, and he has one energy or activity. Mm -hmm. And one, one historical instance that shows you the problem with this is John Askutsangis and John Philopman. And this is recorded by Michael the Syrian, I believe. Uh, this is talked about in... Johannes Zuckerberg's book on the rise of the rise of Christian theology and the, and the end of ancient metaphysics. He talks about this. And John Alskutsang's main point was that if all a person is, is just a particular instantiation of nature and nothing else, and it's basically a particular nature, then the Trinity being three persons is three particular natures, meaning that there are three gods. And there wasn't any good sufficient response to this because he's just you know, logically following the conclusion of monophysite Christology and working into Trinitarian theology. Mm -hmm. And once people realize this, a lot of monophysites, in fact, converted to Orthodox Christianity at that time. This is noted by their own historians, right? Their own yeah. monophysite. I think Michael, well, in this case, is an, is an Armenian. I might be wrong, but he knows, he's a 12th century historian, notes that a lot of people from the Syriac and the Coptic communion, in fact, became Chalcedonian because they realized the connection between Christology and Trinitarian theology. And that if you say that Christ is one nature, you have to say that the Trinity is three natures then and that the, the three gods and your whole theology is just upended. And so when you note these things, and these are, I will say, somewhat simple things. I, I don't think they're super simple, but they're <laughs> yeah. somewhat simple. Once people understand these points, they will realize the logic behind um, the orthodoxy of the church fathers and also this idea that uh, we were just saying the same thing. <laughs> Usually it's from ignorant people and from bad-willed people, right? Yeah. And people that can't think beyond the slogans. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of think of it, of, of it this way, right? You're basically saying that the Holy Spirit could not <laughs> ful fulfill the Pentecostal mission because if a language barrier can cause a schism that lasts for centuries, and it's just a language barrier that's the cause of it, well, then you're basically saying that the Holy Spirit could not unite the different people of different languages together. It's a denial of Pentecost yeah. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thinking doesn't really, it doesn't really, it's a, it's an atheistic kind of thinking. It's a, it's a historical materialist kind of a, kind of a thinking. It's not the kind of a thinking that we should have as Orthodox Christians, I don't think. Yeah. And if we really do believe the same things, then why don't they just accept all those councils? But they aren't accepting those councils because we do believe different things. And like bringing up this issue, it's a disfavor to them to say, oh, this actually isn't an issue because then they aren't actually joining the church versus your videos have helped bring a lot of, you know, oriental people to the true faith instead of validating their false beliefs. You know, we should give the, you know, we should give them a good uneasiness. Like they're not where they should be. They should be, um, you know, in the church and like we have all these, it's not just a polemic. We actually have these reasons like you just talked about to, to believe and these have real practical implications on, on, on ever on everything, on all of theology in the church. This is why studying church history is so important because like this issue didn't just pop up. It's like, you have to see what was going on, what was going on around the centuries during this time. Um, 
because Nestorianism was a huge problem and like how people were reacting to that. Um, do you want to explain Nestorianism too? Because like so, like some people aren't aware aware of these. But that's kind of one thing why the Orientals think they're right. Because with with Nestorianism, I think the basic idea that a lot of people will find out if they just looked at Wikipedia is just say, well, Nestorianism believes that Christ is two persons, a divine, you know, hu a divine word of God and a human, you know, a mere human Jesus Christ that are just united in some kind of external union according to grace. Well, that's not something you will find in Wikipedia, but that's basically how uh, Nestorianism yeah. will be properly explained. Uh, though, if you ask Nestorius, do you believe that there are two different Jesus Christ? He will say, no, I don't believe that. Um, he will say that I believe in one Jesus Christ. But the way he, in which he formulates this is what makes this logically impossible for that to be the case, right? And that's one of the biggest points that uh, the Church Fathers made against uh, Nestorius, mainly St. Kirill of Alexandria, is that, well, it's your, your Christological system is what leads you to there being two Christ. And it's just a repeat of the heresy of you know, some ancient heretics like Paul of Samosata. And that's that's a different history of its own. But yeah. when St. Kirill of Alexandria was reading the various different patristic writings in order to refute Nestorius' heresy, uh, some of the writings that he read were claimed to be from church fathers like St. Athanasius, St. Pope Julius of Rome, and all of these other figures, like St. Gregory of Thaumaturgus, were actually from Apollinaris. Now, Apollinaris is a Christological heretic. He believed that Christ did not have two complete natures. He instead believed that uh, instead of a human mind, the word of God indwelt as the mind, that Christ only had one mind, and that was mm -hmm. the divine mind, and he did not have a uh, rational human soul. Yeah. Right. So he denied that Christ had a rational human soul. And one of the arguments St. Gregory the Theologian makes against this if, if, is if he, Christ if Christ did not assume a rational human soul, then he did not sanctify a rational human soul. Right. So that's one yeah. of the arguments that he makes mm -hmm. against them. So Apollinaris also did not, he was also a Milafsad, actually. Uh, he did not believe that Christ had two complete natures. And so the one nature of God, the word in flesh, right, that slogan that the Milafsads or the so-called Miaphysites use, that actually originates from Apollinarius. And those writings existed in the form of Athanasian writings and other patristic writings that was actually, again, as I said, from Apollinarius. And these forgeries were pointed out by various different uh, church fathers starting from the 5th, 6th centuries. And scholars today also agree that these were actually from Apollinarius. St. Kirill taught these were patristic slogans. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people at that time started to think, well, Nestorius is harping on about how Christ has two natures. And if that's the case, and, and the, these church fathers say that Christ has one nature, if that's the case then really the issue is whether Christ has two natures or one nature, right? If Christ has one nature, then yeah. Nestorianism is refuted. So that's kind of the motivation that kick-started this. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a huge complex history about this. For example, the Chalcedon definition was written by, in fact, Miaphysites, right? People who actually did um, prefer the Miaphysis formula of St. Kirill of Alexandria, which was written from Apollinarius. So it's um, it's not it wasn't as if it was written from historians or anything like that, right? As a lot of Panofs have pointed out. So there's a lot of history behind it, but scholarship has shown us that that formula is from Apollinarius. St. Kirill was influenced uh, at some point by those formulas, but it did not cause his Christology to become heretical because if you read the rest of his writings in context, he does confess that there are two natures in Christ. He says, for example, when it comes to the suffering of the Lord, he says in his letter to Sucensus, he says, though his divine nature did not suffer, he suffered in his earthly nature. Well, that's confessing that there are two natures in Christ, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has many other writings that kind of talk about the distinction of the two natures after the hypostatic union and, and things of that nature. But that's how I will say Nestorianism is related to this controversy as well. Um, a lot of Monophysite polemics was it was motivated by a lot of Nestorian argumentation at the end of the day. And what you will hear from a lot of Monophysite apologists today, online apologists, is that they will say, for example, oh, okay, you believe that the Virgin Mary is the mother of God, but here are these Nestorian people. They also believe that, but they were still Nestorian, right? Or you say that, you know, God, you know, suffered on the cross. Okay, but Nestorians can still say that. And what they try to do is basically say, well, you have to say things in a way that a Nestorian will not say. And they're saying, well, the only way you can avoid being Nestorian is by saying that Christ is one nature. But uh, that's a really a, a false way of making an argument. And in fact, um, if you question the Christological system of the Nestorian, 
even though he might verbally agree with this with several formulas the essence of the formulas will be still different so for example with the mother of god why is virgin mm -hmm. mary the mother of god well they will say well it's just kind of like this external acknowledgement right it's, it doesn't really have any internal reality it's not, it's not really based on anything real whereas we will say well the virgin mary is the mother of god because she gave birth to the word of god mm -hmm. the, the person who is god himself right yeah uh, so they still don't make that nature person distinction right mm -hmm. so that's how you will ascertain the historians not by some slogans right and that again the sloganic thinking <laughs> of the various different heretics is yeah. is is how you have these stupid heresies occur um mm -hmm. in still to this day yeah no i think that's that's that was an amazing refutation that is a very key point on not just like your entire your arguments can't just be a slogan like i know a lot of muslims rely on that too like the, the, the one, one plus one plus one equals like all all that stuff like you just it, it's more complicated than that and that's what one of the things that drew me to orthodoxy was seeing how in depth all the apologists go like you jay ubi petris you know father deacon um ananias like all you all the orthodox people they go into extreme depth defending their positions and not just relying on sloganism when that's just the tendency, especially since a lot of people, that's what they want. People want just like an instant, like easy slogan to, um, to, to follow. Next topic I want to talk about is you have an amazing video on how Eastern Catholic Catholics refute Rome. And so for those who don't know, the Eastern Catholics were basically, you know, there was a great schism in 1054. Now, some of those Orthodox, they went back in communion with Rome that, you know, they're not Orthodox and <laughs> anymore, but uh, this is mainly due to geopolitical reasons. And these Eastern Catholics, they maintained all of the Orthodox, um, practices basically like they don't recite the filioque they want it removed I believe and I, I think pope benedict would have agreed with me we eventually need the filioque taken out of the roman creed at vatican one the melkite patriarch refused to sign vatican one uh they still venerate gregory palamas and david highlighted this in his video how this really shows that rome isn't they don't care about theological unity or unity on the saints they they just care about submitting to the pope like how did you come to making that yeah. video yeah that's that's a perfect point i mean at the end of the day when you look at the when you look at communion the concept of communion yeah and the concept of unity in in christianity it must be based on something right so historically and within the orthodox church the, it is based on the sameness of faith the faith has yeah. to be the same the faith has to be the the faith that you've confessed has to be the same that's why the creed is important right it, there can't be multiple creeds there has to be one creed mm, that is yeah. not changed because if the creed is changed then the substance of the faith is changed even if the change is something even in, in you know meaningless right and, and this was something that was understood particularly after the fifth century yeah so <clears throat> that's a point that we have to we have to bear in mind first and with relation to the eastern catholics and kind of the the point about uh communion and the unity of faith is that it shows us that if to be a roman catholic you don't have to be united on the basis of faith because you can have a different kind of a faith in christ and you can still be a roman catholic yes. right and confessionally right i'm not saying just individually i'm saying confessionally mm -hmm. and that's a big deal yeah all that matters at the end of the day then is that well do you kiss the papal feet if you kiss the papal feet, then congratulations, you're a Roman Catholic. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter if you believe in Christological Nestorianism, which Chaldeans do, the Syro Malabars do. They openly venerate not just Nestorius, but also Theodore of Mopsueste and Theodore of Tarsus, who are two proto Nestorians. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, in their liturgy, they call them the Greek doctors, the Greek fathers. Okay. Yeah. They commemorate them. And so there's, there's that as well. And with, with the so called Orthodox, right? You know the eastern catholics yeah uh, they pretty much you know confess orthodox theology a lot of them right so mm -hmm. they believe saint gregory palamas the saint they uh, they celebrate the sunday of saint gregory gregory palamas so according to the roman catholic church historically the man who was actually a heretic who believed in multiple divinities is now a roman catholic saint yeah. uh, not in the latin calendar okay but the eastern catholics which are officially recognized papally recognized are celebrating him openly as a saint and not just saint gregory palamas but pretty much in the entirety of the orthodox tradition of saints which includes saint mark of ephesus and saint photius even right even these people and yeah. uh, 
and you know you know maybe some individual churches might not use that the, the medallion and they celebrate those things but many of the eastern catholic churches in fact do that right so that's besides the point the roman catholic church officially recognizes this and when you read the uh, alexandria document and the other documents like the chieti document the roman catholic church mm -hmm. has put out they openly admit that part of the essential aspect of the church is within the orthodox tradition right mm -hmm. so, so they see themselves as trying to uh, collect these aspects of the churchnesses within the roman catholic church and they recognize that the orthodox church has those things yeah so from the perspective of the roman catholic church the eastern catholic catholics are not just some you know foreigners that are just like really not real catholics or anything like that no they are authentically part of the roman catholic tradition just as much as the latin tradition is yeah so you can't really go go that route route either so once i like retro a lot of the eastern catholics and the whole idea the concept of it and the bizcaf forums and what <laughs> the people who actually go to eastern catholic churches say and yeah. what they write and what their priests say what their bishops say what their official websites and their eparchies and their bishops say mm -hmm. I just read all of those things and I realized, well, they're basically, you know, LARPing as Orthodox, but they kiss the papal feet and the Roman Catholic Church recognizes this and they recognize their saints. That's a contradiction, right? Yeah. At, at the end of the day, that's a contradiction to, you know, historically say that the Orthodox are heretics for not believing in the filioque to then say, okay, you can actually be Roman Catholic and say the creed without the filioque. <laughs> yeah. That's a contradiction. Yeah. And if you read the Council of Florence, what happened in the Council of Florence, the bishops of the Council of Florence, the Roman Catholic bishops, taught the Orthodox were heretics mm -hmm. for not believing in the filioque. Now suddenly, and this happened after the Council too, now suddenly, oh, actually you can say the two creeds. Well, that, that, that means there are two faiths. And that means there's no real communion of faith. That means that the Roman Catholic faith is not one. Yeah. And so if the Roman Catholic is not one and it's not Catholic, then it's not holy either. It's certainly not apostolic either. Then it's not the true church. Then mm -hmm. that de facto makes the orthodox church the true church from the roman catholic perspective and i try to tell this to people a lot of times and i think i made that point clear in the eastern catholic video and i yeah. try to tell this this people and they find ways to cope around this and it's very difficult to understand that mindset but that's how i will kind of summarize the the thought process that i had in making the video and you know after having made the video i guess three years ago yeah. uh so I'm happy that it has helped helped you. I, I'm glad to see that you kind of realized that. that yeah. But I hope a lot more people start to realize that as uh -huh. well. Because nowadays people are, there's some people that are like proudly Byzantine Catholic. <laughs> I know. There's some yeah. proud to be Byzantine Catholic about. Uh -huh. You're just proof that the Roman Catholic Church is wrong. Exactly. <laughs> and it's so ironic because they're like, they're, the Western polemic is, oh, the Eastern, the Orthodox are so divided. But it's like, we have real unity. We have theological unity. We have unity on on the saints we have unity in liturgy versus in the catholic church you have they're, they're saying different creeds they have different saints they believe different theology i mean you have some western catholics saying that gregory palamas is a hindu he's polytheism and all these things it's like a lot of these the, the western Catholic western catholics they don't even know that you know gregory palamas is a saint and so when i tell them that they're like well they don't they don't know what they say they just said now they say oh it's a mystery but it's like you know your entire polemic was that the orthodox church is so divided but we actually have real unity in the orthodox church we maybe there's some superficial geopolitical things going on but in your church you don't you don't even have theological unity you don't have liturgical unity from the fssp to the sspx to the novus ordo parishes to the eastern catholics even within the eastern catholics like you're like you're talking about the uh, cyril malabar versus the melkites on your video you bring up the the melkite website which says that they only accept seven councils and it's funny because when i was catholic i tried going to an eastern catholic church and one of my like last draws was calling the melkite priest and talking to him about these issues and he's like he like agreed on all the issues he's like yes the filioque needs to be removed he yes you know vatican one is is a huge accretion it's like what well, what's the point of being in communion with 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 the pope and he's like well it's better to fight in communion but it's like like you were saying they aren't catholic they aren't one you're supposed to have one faith and and they don't they don't have that you don't even have the, the same creed and the, like it contradicts no salvation outside the church and the trad catholics think they're so they're so like base because they're like oh uh no salvation outside the church but it's like 
Rome cl clearly teaches that there is salvation outside of the church. Not not just with the Eastern Catholics. I mean, even in the Latin rite, they have Gregory of Narek. They yes. have, uh, they recently canonized the uh, the Coptic martyrs, right? Yeah. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, it's very, very, is it? Well, well, so now they say instead, oh, well, the church is, you know, it's not just limited to the papacy. It's like mystically outside of the of the church as <laughs> yeah. well, right? It's like, in the, and they are, and like, for example, with Gregory of Narek, I've heard a Roman Catholic, for example, say, well, the Armenian church was unorganized, well, right? And so we can't really say that he was outside of the church um, in, in a real sense. It's like, well, by their logic, a real organized church is is one that has the papacy <laughs> by their logic. Yeah. So any church outside of church is unorganized, which means any church that is unorganized is actually part of the Roman Catholic Church as well. I mean, this is just kind of like nonsensical understanding where like Roman Catholics and their popular their pop apologists will say this too, right? They will say, Oh, you know, we actually believe you to be Roman Catholic, but you have to be really Roman Catholic. It's, yeah. it's just not it's just utterly nonsensical and it's turning the roman catholic church into this like perennialist like this christian perennialist yeah, initially which then will become real perennialistic one world religion and that's and i see some trad based roman catholics openly admit yes we want to have one world government one world religion <laughs> right? yeah it's like i understand in a sense i understand it's like yes everyone should be christian everyone should you know be of my religion i i, I, I in a sense i understand that yeah. but you should want them to be freely united to the church by having the same faith. The Roman Catholic vision is not the sameness of faith. It's the sameness of worshipping the authority of the platonic form of the papal chair of Peter. Yeah. Uh, and th that's the that's the end of the day, right? That's mm -hmm. that's the that's what matters for the Roman Catholic system at the end of the day. And and, 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 and when, when you kind of debate them on this, like they will talk about how like, oh, look at this early church father who says, you know, this about the Sea of Peter and this this about the Roman yeah. Sea and the Apostolic Sea and all of these quotes. And, and you just kind of have to ask them, well, do you think they were thinking about this, like the Roman Catholic Church as it is today right now with yeah. kind of like these kinds of authorities? Or are you just reading into what they're really saying? Yeah. Right. And at the end of the day, it's just them reading into what um, the what they what they believe the church fathers are saying is is it's the main issue at hand here as well yeah and Stop. you had that one video about how like these papal claims like they say this about other patriarchs like the patriarch of antioch they use this grandiose language at certain times because they're basically like trying to get a certain theological thing resolved and they'll appeal to different patriarchs and and you know they will appear to the patriarch of rome like other patriarchs like the patriarch of rome it was doubly apostolic, you know, Peter and Paul died there. It had a high place of honor, but that doesn't, again, you're right. They're totally reading into like Vatican I, papal supremacy, all this stuff that didn't exist. But in those recent admissions uh, by the Catholic Church in the Andrea and Shady documents, it admits that it wasn't that way, that it would. So was the papacy something that evolved over time or was it the Vatican I papacy from the very beginning? I never get a consistent answer. On a Gregory of Narek, as a saint he died 600 years after the armenians rejected chalcedon so that that's that's such a long time and now he could be a doctor of the church you can be a doctor of the church when you were never in in the communion with the papacy that makes no sense the saint that i was talking about is saint sergius of radonesh he is canonized by the roman catholic church in the latin rites wow so he's he's within the calendar as well saint sergius of radonesh yeah he was canonized in uh, in in the Orthodox Church in 1449, yeah. So just think about that. So he lived years after the schism. Yeah, and then another point is that the way that the Catholic Church is going, it's like before the Pope was the supreme teacher of all Christians, and he alone had the key. But now, you know, like you're talking about with perennialism and this ecumenism and just like interface stuff, and now with like the Abrahamic Faith Center, they are trying to create this like one world religion it's like you can believe whatever you know just submit to the pope just be under the influence of the pope i mean they even have they've have, they have a mayan rite of the mass and that that was surprise like i thought that was just like some polemic no you can look this up they have a mayan rite of the mass and it's com completely pagan but i guess i guess it's okay as long as you submit to uh the, the key i think i think, I think yeah. a lot of roman catholics they don't really live in reality about these things they they live in this isolated bubble and this platonic form where they think that they still live 
in the 15th century, 16th century, or 14th century, like or the greatest periods of the Roman Catholic Church, where there were no problems, which still had a lot of problems, but they, they think that they live in this golden age in like yeah. made up in their mind, and it's just like, oh, you know, you know, once Francis goes away, we'll get a base pope and you know he'll fix everything, even though all the cardinals he elected are not gonna allow that, right? But um, you know. They don't see what Roman Catholicism actually is in reality. And the way yeah. you see that is in the liturgy, in the mass, yes. right, in the prayers, in the practical prayers, and how it is done. So one of the arguments they'll say again, with like no unity, like you don't, you don't, you don't have any proper unity, or you don't have any proper authority to handle things. If that was true, then you know the Orthodox Christianity will be rife with liturgical abuses. Now, now, obviously, liturgical abuses do happen in the Orthodox Church at times, but compared to the Roman Catholic Church, we barely have any liturgical abuses, and the liturgical abuses that we do have pale in comparison to the liturgical abuses that you see in the Roman Catholic Church, even if you, like, you know, try to compare per capita or something like that. Still, the Roman Catholic Church has <laughs> yeah. a lot more liturgical abuse going on, and that goes to show you that... Uh, what what good does the authority do for you if you still can't maintain the essential core aspect of the faith, mm -hmm. which is the service itself? Yeah. If you can't have the proper service, then what, what good is the authority for you? Moreover, we do have authority. We just have authority over various different churches that are united in the sameness of faith. And, you know, whenever there's an issue that it has to be handled by various different other Orthodox patriarchs, there is a Pan-Orthodox Synod or what was called previously an Ecumenical Synod. And we had many of these, and this is a popular polemic, right? Oh, you can't make any, you, you can't do any ecumenical councils, right? It's like, yeah. um, we have had dogmatic ecumenical pan-Orthodox councils after the schism. We had many of them. We had, mm. um, we had them with the Pesachas synods. We had yeah. th this with the Council of Jerusalem. We have many examples of Orthodox synods, synods that you have to universally accept as an Orthodox Christian. So, that's not something that's not a problem that we have so it's a popular meme argument but it's not a real <laughs> argument and that's yeah. the main thing here that was one of the biggest wake up calls for me is like how can this church that's supposed to be guided by the holy spirit how can they mess up in something as fundamental as the liturgy because you know when i was catholic i was like i went to a Noah's ordo parish but when i found out about the tlm like the traditional latin mass i'm like it's actually reverent i'm like i couldn't make i'm like i'm never going back to the Noah's ordo because it's literally just a Protestant mass. How could you mess up on something on how we worship God, especially in the Old Testament? It's so, uh, you know, it's so like we need to worship God in a certain way. How could we mess up something that fundamental? And it's like, despite, you know, you in the Orthodox world, under communism, under Muslim rule, the Orthodox have been, main, they haven't had a heretical uh, ecumenical council. They don't have modernist saints. They don't have a modernist liturgy. Like despite all the oppression, they they've maintained the faith and in the catholic church they've had material prosperity and but where is all the bad things happening from it's literally coming from the pope it's it, like the, the pope is the cause of these problems and it's like if orthodox have like we don't teach any heresy in councils uh we don't we have the liturgy we still make amazing saints like you can read our modern saints and their modern day church fathers i mean we ha they the, the catholics even say we have christ in the eucharist so what exactly is the point of being catholic like i just it i have to submit to a pope who's also a heretic like it's just a mental gymnastic and i think that's why it just drives a lot of people like if you're really trying to take your catholic faith seriously it just it doesn't make any sense you just got to become orthodox father here says a good title for a video where yeah. he's like we have christ but we need the pope yeah i mean isn't it supposed to be the other exactly. way around if like what's what we're supposed to need right yeah exactly and then my last question is do you want to go in depth about the filioque because on my channel i talk about how you know the councils forbidden and anathematized any changes to the creed the filioque does go against scripture i had i had many uh I ended up having to do many videos about it because on a, on one level it's a very simple issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually pinpoint it what the problem exactly is. Uh, on on the other hand, it's a difficult issue, and and what makes it difficult is that a lot of people use some of the terms that they don't even know about. So like they they say, oh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, but like you ask them, what do you mean by procession? It's like, uh, uh I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I I I ask this to multiple people every time. Like this conversation it just makes more sense to me. It's like, okay, what do you think procession means? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it made sense to me when someone was telling me what it was about. Yeah. So, 
um, the main, the the main, I I think the creedal argument is is good. It's decent, but I think uh, you kind of have to define the terms, right? Like, what is it? What does the creed say when it says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, or the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son? Yeah. Um, and what it means, especially if you read the writings of the Cappadocian Fathers, is that it's talking about hypostatic procession. That is the manner in which the Holy Spirit exists, right? So does he exist in the manner of begetting? No, that's how the son exists, right? He be, he's begotten of the father, but the Holy Spirit ex exists in the mode of proceeding from the father. And so why is it just from the father, not from the father and the son? Well, it's because the the power, the, the personal property of being cause is unique to a divine person alone. It's not it's not common to the Trinity, because if it was common to the Trinity, it will it will beget another trinity and it will beget more divine persons, etc. etc. It doesn't make any logical sense, right? Mm -hmm. If that power was inherent in all of the divine persons, or if that power was inherent in, in the Father and the Son alone, that will make the Holy Spirit less than God, which is obviously heretical. So it's it's a it's a property that is proper to a divine person alone, right? So only one divine person has it in the Trinity. This is a point emphatically made by various different church fathers like Saint Gregory of Nyssa various different works for that personal properties are not, first of all, they're not communicated. You can't communicate that to another person because it will be like communicating your personhood to another person. Can I communicate like Davidness <laughs> to you and make it David Kyle? Like obviously no, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's like that. And so it's something that is inherent and unique to the person of the Father alone, which is why the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. So the question then here mm -hmm. is, well, how do we explain a relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit? Because it seems like this is used by various different church fathers. They even use the term procession for the Holy Spirit, for the Father and the Son. How do we understand how it seems to be the case even in Revelation 22.1? And so this is made the case by making a distinction between hypostatic procession and energetic procession, which is the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son. So, for example, the Holy Spirit is uh, is the love between the Father and the Son, and He manifests that eternally. So, in that sense, there's an eternal uh, energetic procession from the Father through the Son of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a temporal procession that is the Holy Spirit being sent to creation from the Father through the Son. So, uh, you can speak of a procession in that sense, but that's not what the Creed is saying. Right? The Creed is not yeah. talking about procession of the Holy Spirit in that sense. It's talking about the procession of the, of the Holy Spirit in the sense of hypostatic procession. Because that's what John 15, 26 is referring to. And we can understand this by seeing how Christ distinguishes between the procession of the Holy Spirit, right? That the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the sending of the Holy Spirit, which is from the Father and the Son. We as Orthodox, we're completely fine with saying the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and the Son and proceeds in that sense. We're completely fine with saying that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of the Son. But as St. John Damascus says, we say that He's the spirit of the son, but not from the son, right? Yeah. He's the spirit from mm -hmm. God. He's the spirit from the father. So that's how we will, how we will explain, uh, explain some of the patristic writings. And once you explain these things, and once you showcase that the main problem is that, the, that there's only one cause in the Godhead, that's the father, and that the Holy Spirit is caused from the father alone, this is emphatically argued by St. Gregory, uh, St. Maximus the Confessor in his letter to Marinus, and by the Capitokian Fathers, any filioquist metaphysic is completely demolished and unacceptable. Wrong. And what the Council of Florence argues with the causation is the Council of Florence basically said that the Holy that the Holy Spirit caused from the Father and the Son dogmatically, right? Yeah. End of debate. So there's a big difference between the two positions. Not just a language issue either. That was mm -hmm. perfect. Um, I've got a bunch more topics, but I think this is a good place to end it. We'll, we're going to have to do a part two, but. You know, my last question, uh, closing question is, what are your future plans? You know, you, any any uh, big plans? You just want to keep focusing on your YouTube or plans? Yeah. Um, well, so in the short term, I'm working on a video that's basically about the divinity of Christ from the Old Testament alone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I thought it will just be like this whole like giga collection video like I did with the icons, but I might divide it into multiple videos as well. Yeah. I'm like, we'll see in the future, depending on how it goes. And in terms of that, like in the long term, I kind of want to get into like, I kind of hinted at it, but I guess, you know, it's just continuing what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. uh, I won't mind getting into the debate scene or anything like that in the future, just because I, I see a lot of people, especially kind of getting into it. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of more like a, you know, 
it's it's less of like i want to debate and more like a well i listen to what these people say and they're not really making a good case for themselves kind <laughs> yeah. of like a thing and i kind of want to get into this scene myself to kind of like i guess provide what i some of the stuff that i know um to yeah. kind of like it's kind of like like a thing that like that might be of benefit for people but you know it's been a while since i debated like i i used to kind of be big into debating but then i stopped doing it for like three four years so i'm i am a very rested person when it comes to that but other than that i, I think the long-term goal is just kind of like doing this like yeah keep doing what i'm doing and just like expand on more different topics and you know just move on from there but you know there might come something in the future that um might be i suppose unexpected right so <laughs> yeah i'll just leave it that yeah all right cool yeah i know i would love to see you uh do some more debates i think you'd be a really good debater i think you you did some on the crucible bad arguments out there there's a lot of people who shouldn't be debating and it's like i know i watch the arguments i'm like i can make a better debate that like do make a better argument than that but it is it is harder when you're actually doing it like i've done a few debates and i've just had the worst like opponents like both bad faith and it kind of like black pilled me on debating but it, it is fun when you get you know a charitable um opponent but yeah i will definitely be looking out for that but yeah thank you so much i thank you for having me i really appreciate being here and happy to share my thoughts at any time any other time you want me to be on here awesome thank you god bless